so let's talk a little bit about the materials. Okay. Now, there are a few things we're going to be covering. Okay. We'll talk a little bit about how to use a glass palette. Talk a little bit about the canvas, the slow drying medium, the paint colors we're going to be using. Okay. Specifically. And then any other information we can use in order to develop our canvases and our paintings. Now let's talk a little bit about the canvas pads. Now the canvas pads look, just move all this, look pretty much like this. You can start to see here. Again, if my video dies or if anything gets a little confusing, guys, just let me know. The, these are the 12 by 16 pads. The canvas pads are, again, it's just canvas, but that's not stretch. So you could move it, you could, you know, you could um, necessarily roll it, you know, you could ship it to somebody if you want to do that as well. You could store it, but at least that's there. And remember, when you're using your tape, depending on what, which one you have, it's pretty much the same thing. This is the drafting tape, which is some sort of a sort of neutral color. And this is blue painter's tape. It's completely up to you. Um, you want to work on a flat surface and really tape your edges. Okay. Let's look at an example of a work of art that's been done through the canvas pads. So this is a part of one of our assignments we're going to be using. So this is the monochromatic landscape. Okay. You can see that all of those edges have been taped off. So it's a nice clean cut. So you don't have to worry about in terms of uh, cropping or anything like that. I always leave that on there until the end of the painting when it's fully dry and slowly remove it. But you can start to see here, look, over time, it does start to buckle and bend. That's because obviously it wasn't completely straight and I added too much water because it's not fully stretched on a wooden panel, okay? So this is something to sort of think about. So I do have a variety of some of these examples that we're gonna be covering because I have another one here of a complimentary and then an analogous sort of color palette we're gonna be doing. And this is what I mean about using your canvas pads as a sketch, because that, some of this is important to sort of think about because a part of those uh, preliminary paintings that we do on our canvas pads will be required throughout the quarter for certain assignments. Any questions about that? About canvas pads so far? Now, again, I did have a can two sets of the um, Blick version. These are the smaller nine by twelves, um, but for the canvas pads, you need the twelve by sixteen. Okay, but I do have a new one here that a uh, that I did purchase just for just in case if I do need more um, in terms of sort of making some swatches or colors on the canvas pads before beforehand. Palette paper. Let's look at the palette paper. This is the nine by twelve. Those of you who already purchased your palette paper, great. Okay, the palette paper is a really sort of glossy material, it looks like almost like wax paper. This is what we're gonna be using for our colors, okay? We'll pour some colors onto the palette paper. And the beauty about this is that, for example, if we're done, we just take it out and throw it away. There's no other cleanups to do after that, which is great. Less cleanup, the more time to paint, okay? Any questions about palette paper? Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the, uh, another option. Remember, it's an option. It's not required. The glass palette. Now, again, those of you who are more interested in making a glass palette, you're more than happy to do that. This was available at Blick that you can get that has a sort of a case where you can cover the glass palette. It's pretty thick too. It's like, um, it's like, this is how like, this is the back of it. It's like around one and a half inch thick. It's a sort of like a large tray that you can just pick up. And what's great about it is that the top has these little uh, legs. So when you close it, you can then just sort of like put it away and then come back to it the next day and then just pop this out so it doesn't fully dry. But what's really great about the glass palette, I'm gonna take it out of this space, is that this one, actually was, um, they didn't have any backing to it, uh, meaning that I actually put a gray sheet of paper in the back, because this is, was like a clear glass sheet. 
And what I've done is sort of tape the edges with painter's tape. And over time, you can start to see some of it has been scratched off, but it's great to use because what I've noticed, and specifically as a painter, when I add white on a glass palette, it's hard to see on the sheet. So that's why when you add a gray sheet on the background as a neutral, you can start to see when you're mixing your whites or mixing, you know, tints or uh, lights on your palette, you can start to see the differences and see how vibrant or how bright that is. That makes sense. Okay. Remember, this is an option. You are not required to purchase any of this. You can if you want to. You could also, I've seen students go to a thrift store and actually uh, purchase an old um, picture frame you know, take a sheet of paper and just put some duct tape or some painter's tape on the edges. Remember this is glass, so it's fragile, okay? That's why it comes in this sort of case, this little lip, this tray, because then I can just sort of pop it in here and then literally put it away. But so if you have, if you don't have a container like this, you don't need to purchase this, okay? This I think ranges for like 20 bucks. It may be a little bit cheaper at um, at Blix. So if you're interested, I will have that available on the on the Canvas modules tab, so you can look at those as a, as an option. But as long as you have your palette paper, okay. Let's talk a little bit about palette knives. I have a few here that I wanted to sort of discuss. Now, this is always again the option whether or not if we want to be able to use multiple palettes or just one. You honestly just need one. You don't need that many. This first one here is a little old. This was one of my one of my baby palette knives that I've had for like, oh God, um, since 2009. So it's been with me a long time. I just, I don't get rid of them because I feel like you could still use it, right? You could still blend with it. But if I cleaned this up and took a blade and sort of just cleaned off all those, those dry um, colors, off of there, I can do that, but I don't necessarily have to. So that's this roughly small size. Here's the next one up, okay, which is really great. Remember, they're very flexible. They're very bendy, okay? Because once you start to move, I'm just doing this slowly, your pigments and your paints on that glass palette or on your palette paper, it's then easier to pick it up and then put it down. You pick it up and put it down. Now these ones, this knife edge is sort of sort of a different sort of kind of style. And you can use that because this edge here, you could use to remove or subtract paint off your surface. So for example, if I have my paper, I can go, I can pick it up or I can drag it across to the surface of my canvas, okay? Here's a larger one here for larger scale paintings. I like to do this when I'm mixing a lot of paint. Remember, a little bit goes a long way. You can start to see it has more a wider bottom so it can hold more physical paint. But in relationship to here, which is roughly in around the same height, but the width is a lot, lot more narrower, you could then have more flexibility of the, of the tip of the head to be much more bendy, okay? And then this one here, this one has a more sort of, again, uh, width in terms of its uh, wider base uh, and tip here, but then slowly gets tapered. And you can start to see here, you can start to then again, move more and more in terms of the surface. Here are just, again, just a few examples of some of the palettes. I would recommend something like this, to be honest, which is around probably as big as like, like almost as big as my index. So you can, if you want to purchase something like this. Now it goes back to the question whether or not if you want to use a palette knife that is metal or you could use one that is plastic. And this, I don't, I don't have a plastic one here, but it should be the same thing. Okay, so keep that in. Any questions about palette knives? Okay. Talked a little bit about the tape, remember? Again, I do have some um, some white eraser that we're gonna be talking a little bit about, uh, but not in this assignment, because again, part of this, uh, for the still life painting itself, we're gonna be painting. We're not gonna be drawings. We're not gonna use any pencils or anything like that, but this is great to use for erasing 
pencil marks onto the uh, color wheel. So if you want to make sure the the, the uh, angles are correct, that's another thing to keep in mind. Now I do have my aluminum ruler. Okay, this is extremely important to use when you're uh, working on our paintings. Uh, there is a backing that's sort of like almost um, sort of matte finish that they have on the pad on the back. This pad here is great when you're applying pressure and it doesn't move. So if like, if you had it on certain angles and you wanted to like draw a straight line or paint a straight line, you could use that to your uh, advantage. So keep that in mind. Uh, rulers are gonna be crucial for the grid. So if you wanna make a diagonal, that's really, really important to sort of think about. Let's now talk a little bit about brushes. So I have a fan and then I have two other brushes that we're gonna be talking about. So this is a number 16, and then this is a number six. So let's talk a little bit about these. So brushes, again, are very sort of subjective, okay? Meaning that part of this is sort of depending on how you wanna go about doing this in terms of painting styles, painting techniques. A good rule of thumb would be to sort of think about, is that better? Can we see that more clearly? Just wanted to zoom in. We have a Bristol brush, and then we have two synthetics. Synthetics are, again, a more synthetic material. They're more plasticky, but it's easier to wash and clean. And these synthetic brushes are usually better for <laughs> acrylic paints. Shauna, go ahead. Is there a specific size for the fan brush that we would need? I would say this one is a number eight size, but I do have smaller ones too. Let me see. This is a number six. Do you can see the difference? I would yeah. say anything between a six to an eight. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Of course. Now, when we're looking, like this is a number 16 brush, but you can see the tip of that is sort of kind of jutting outward slightly. This is a great sort of beginner brush where you're gonna be using for drawing the painting because we will be using the actual tip as well as the entire brush. So depending on how much pressure you apply. So a little bit of pressure, a lot of pressure, you can apply it to towards that uh, brush. But this is a great, size. This is the number 16 synthetic. And these ones are great for acrylics and oil uh, water-based materials. Now this is a number six fan brush that is Bristol. You can see here there was some green left over on there because that wasn't properly cleaned. Okay. That's something we have to sort of remember to keep in mind. I would rather you guys purchase three to four brushes max instead of a whole set, like 20, because more is gonna have more problems and you may sometimes you know, not need to ha uh, have so many. Um, the Bristols are fantastic because they're also good for uh, oils. They're a lot stronger to my personal experience and they last slightly longer, okay? That makes sense. This is going to be a number six rounded. We'll talk a little bit about that too. So let's talk a little bit about flat to round edges. I had a question about the color wheel assignment. Yeah, go ahead. Is there like a rubric for us to be able to follow on canvas? For the color wheel? Yeah, like no. is there any attachments to like measure out anything? Say that one more time. What do you mean uh, attachments to measure? Is there like videos on how to make the circle or like the like specific dimensions basically? Well, we, we just talked about it in the lecture. It's, so it's 10 inches in diameter. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed that. No, it's okay, no worries. It should be on the lecture, but I can go through that again if you, you want me to. Like in no, person. it's okay, I can just go back to it. Yeah, no, no, again, guys, if you're if you miss something, just always let me know because then I might have made a mistake, and if it's not on there, just um, keep me updated and just let me know. Say hey, I, you know the the links are not working, the slides are off or not are offline. 
I'll, I'll show you how to actually make the grid, excuse me, uh, make the color wheel on our canvas path later today as well. Okay. Thank you. Just for more context. Absolutely. Um, I want to talk, any other questions so far? I want to bring in sort of the differences between a flat and a round. Okay. So these are two brushes. One is a 16 and the other one is a six. Okay. They're, they're both Bristol. One is sort of rounded. The other one's flat. Now, this is a sort of preference that I think that, again, artists are really um, aware of because of their certain styles. When you're holding a flat brush, you can get that sort of nice, even application. You could also make a straight edge, vertical or horizontal, depending on what you want to do. But then the rounded edge almost has a sort of more organic feeling. It has that kind of imperfection depending on your application of brushes. So when you're shopping around your brushes, look in detail to see what size you wanna use, but also do you wanna use a round or a flat? I'm gonna leave that decision up to you. I would recommend buy one of each and experiment. Use one flat, one round, one sort of um, generic sort of synthetic brush. That's sort of a number 16, right? and then use a fan. So a good four is more than enough, okay? You could use a number, this is a number six fan, and this is a number eight, I, you know, it's really up to you. But if you're still hesitant about, you know, buying what materials would be the best, I did purchase this as an option. These are great for oils and acrylics. These are from Utrecht, the brand. I got these from Blick directly. And it has a sort of set. Oh, it's really hard to get this out. Hold on. There you go. Now, each one, this one has a sort of a number on each one. So there's a number four, number eight, number 12, and number 18. And it's great too, because also they're sort of um, slightly in different sizes, but they have sort of different properties that you can think about. Let's say, for example, the small one. Let's see. This is like really taped on, hold on. I'm gonna cut this off or remove this tape. Now this, you notice here, since it's so small, it had a little plastic cover. These are good for details, right? You don't necessarily have to buy this. I will have this kit on the supply list too, just for, again, if you wanna just buy a kit instead of buying individual brushes, this is a great, beginner's kit that I would I would recommend but I noticed it didn't come with the fan brush so I would just go ask you can buy this kit and then just add a fan brush okay questions about that any questions about material so far guys don't be shy to ask remember this is your opportunity Now let's get into color. Now, remember on the supplies, we do have a few options, okay? We have the Windsor Newer brands that I highly recommend, or you could do the Utrecht brands or the Dick Wick brands. We have a few colors here. We have this Viridian Green, and that is complemented with what? An Elizabeth Crimson. The Crimson is a beautiful blood red. I hope you guys are keeping notes because this is the very, very important part of this aspect of this class is finding the right colors. I have that list available on the supply list. So if you go to the supply list, all of this should be available. So you have the Viridian Green, you have Elysium Crimson, you have your Cobalt or French Ultramarine Blue, you have your Burnt Sienna, you have your Burnt Umber, and this is an option if you want to do Burnt Umber or Raw Umber. And then you have your yellow ochre. I do actually have the cadmium yellow or the cadmium red, but I actually ran, ran out of my cadmium red, which I need to go pick up some more. And I did have uh, one of my students actually gave me a, all of their paints, which is you know great for for uh, you know making more demos. But um, when they graduated, they gave me a lot of their larger tubes. This is the lemon yellow, which is similar to that sort of cadmium. And then I have a large tube 
of the titanium white. You can start to see here, I've used quite a bit of this. And this is obviously the um, eight ounce, and then you have the smaller two ounces here. So I would highly recommend getting these colors um, accordingly. Oh, here, I'll do, I'll leave this on here for more context. And we're gonna talk a little bit about how to mix these, right? As well as sort of figuring out what we can do in the relationships of our paintings. Our primaries will be our crimsons, cobalts, and then lemon yellow for our color wheel. And then we'll get into that now. Any questions about the colors? Hi, so I don't have that specific like brand of paint. So for this lesson, can I just like use what paint I have and then add that brand later? Again, guys, state your name when you're speaking, just so I can keep track of who's speaking. Oh, my name is Rebecca. Go ahead, Rebecca. What, uh, Rebecca, what, what brand do you have? Um. Then the supplies where we're supposed to get the Windsor New Orleans, but let me know which one you have. I just have like Craft Smart. Can you show me what that is? So I can just see what that looks like. Hold on, let me remove my pen. See what that looks like. It's just like. Okay. See, that's not going to work. Those are for like crafting things. Uh, the reason why, because those ones, Rebecca, don't have the pigment necessary in order to blend in the correct colors. You can okay. practice with them today and see how you feel, but I would highly recommend as the instructor to sort of recommend get the ones that are on the supply list. And remember, you can get the smaller tubes, okay? In okay. order to save some money, uh, because I know sometimes they could be really expensive. So I factor that in. But the one available on the supply list, let me pull that up right now before we start. Let me just make sure. Those ones actually have very distinctive properties when we're thinking about which colors to use, as well as you all can see this, correct? In my screen share. Let me know if you can. Okay, perfect. These ones, it's either the Utrecht Dick Blick ones or the Windsor Newton ones. These are the colors we have to use. Okay. Part of this, let's say, for example, Rebecca, if you're presenting your work, and if I asked you, what colors did you use, right? And you'll say, I used more viridian green. Uh, I added a layer of burnt sienna. I also added more sort of alizarin crimson on the left-hand side. You'll have that terminology ready for you. So then let's say, for example, if I gave you suggestions about your paintings, if I gave you feedback, I can say, hey, Rebecca, do me a favor, add a layer of the yellow ochre on top of this side of the painting. You'll know exactly what you're doing, okay? But then, because I don't know what colors you have specifically, you have a whole set, which is great. I would say, you know, don't get rid of it, but this is what I mean about like sort of thinking about using the correct materials just for the sake of these paintings that we're gonna be doing for the, for the class. That makes sense? Yeah. And guys, I know that the fact that sometimes art supplies can be really pricey, but remember, if you do ever need um, assistance and things like that, I mean, again, I know I, I live in Seattle, obviously, which is a, a, a what, an hour north away. Um, the best thing would, would be to sort of find a retailer, Walmart, Target, Hobby Lobby, Joanne Fabrics, you know, like Michael's, you can call Blick just to find smaller alternatives. You, know, you, don't you don't have to get the bigger eight ounce tubes, get a small one. And you could do it one at a time if you feel comfortable because you'll start to say, as long as you get your primaries, your blues, your yellows and your red and some white, that's all you need. That's really all you need, okay? Um, so I would go from there and we can come back to it a little bit later on, all right? Any other questions about the work? Okay, so what I'm gonna do is now 
I'm just grabbing my sharpener. I'm just taking a pencil. Oh, hold on. Let me pen this. Okay. I'm just taking a 2B pencil. And I have my canvas pads. That on the side. And now I'm going to make my color wheel. Alrighty, so I have my canvas paper. Move everything away from me. Okay. And again, we'll jump over to the canvas here a little bit later on. I do have my studio 16 by, oh, hold on, 16 by 20 inch traditional uh, profile version of the canvas we're going to be using. I do have two of them here that we're going to be using for the demo. But remember, you always want to start off here with your canvas paper because you want to make all those mistakes first. And we go from there. So what I like to do on my sheets of paper, okay? Let's do this, it'll be better. Okay. I like to make a sort of, again, a vertical line that runs through the center. This is my canvas paper. Remember, this is canvas paper. My pa canvas pad, excuse me. <laughs> People are probably wondering like, wait, what is he talking about, canvas paper? And then now I do a horizontal line in the center. Again, I'm not interested, I am not interested in the measurement specifically. That 10 inch in diameter is just a, it's just a useful tool. Okay, you don't necessarily have to follow that. I'm gonna make a diagonal from corner to corner because these canvas pads are pretty big. And I make it, oh, looks like, see, right when I did that, I can uh, I have to lower this because this was too high. Let's do it here again. That's actually good that happened. Yeah. Oh, I need to correct this too. So let's take this out. You can see that white eraser, wonderful, takes off so much so quickly. I would start off with the diagonals first. I should have done that. <laughs> That's okay. And I'm going to make a lot of mistakes. But hey, guess what? We make the mistakes first on our what? Canvas pads. Okay, I'm going to make another horizontal line that meets in that center. Okay. I added a little bit more pressure so you can see it. And then made a vertical line that runs through here. Make sure that's correct. Okay. So then now, what I can do, did everybody follow this so far? If those of you who are working on your canvas beds, you can follow along with me if you would like. You could take your ruler. I mark it at five in the middle, okay? I mark zero and then 10. Bam, there's my 10 inches, 10. I flip my canvas paper, do the same thing, okay? We have zero, we have 10. You see that? Do you see what I'm doing? I'm figuring out the measurements. Now, say for example, if it's on that horizontal orientation, I can always put this at an angle following this diagonal line. I'm gonna mark it at five, because what's half of 10? Five, and do the same thing here. This is a really great useful trick. Five, that's five, that's 10. What, ha what have I in, uh, now? I have a circle. And literally what you can do is just start adding these together. And it should, it's not gonna be 100% perfect, but it's more than enough to make my color wheel. You see that? Does that make sense so far?
Perfect. Now let's talk a little bit about that triangle in the middle. Remember, because we talked a little bit about like adding that color wheel onto our actual slides. So, uh, excuse me, from our slides, we're going to go back. And again, when you go to the modules tab, when you go to the handout, remember to click on that second one where it says acromatic grayscale and color wheel. Scroll down and you should see this. Let me do a screen share if you guys have more contacts. You should see here. Let me go back. I'll go back to it one more time. So go to the handout, color wheel, acromatic gray, click on this, scroll down. This is what I'm following right there. Okay. So I then can make a perfect triangle by using my what? My measurements, okay? Now, obviously this is, I'm gonna just use this format as the base. This will be the top, this will be the bottom. I can, rem I remember that was five, okay? Now there's a few things I can do. I could put it at 2.5, right? 2.5 is half of five, right? I can mark it as, Mark it here and then mark it here. Right. But then I can make a straight line. I'm just going to make it actually from five. Okay. I'm going to do it really lightly. And again, this doesn't necessarily have to be perfect. I'm just trying to find okay. So I have a sort of an idea of a triangle. You can make it smaller, you can make it wider. I'm actually going to raise this up slightly. I feel like it's a little too too tall. Mark it. I'm actually going to mark it right here from meeting this edge. Yeah, that sounds better. I'm going to connect these ones. I'm marking it at this edge here because I want that triangle to be simple. I don't want it to be too busy. Okay. Erase this. Okay. And then I can also erase some of this. Now I could just freehand by just, that will be my red, okay, yellow and blue. And that's all, pretty self-explanatory. Now the same thing can be applied. Let's say for example, if I wanna, if I wanna make a tertiary or secondary color, I'm just gonna say, I'm gonna drop this down to about an inch. So it's actually right over here, which is perfect. I'm gonna take this corner. And that's more than enough again. Again, they don't have to be perfect. I'm not interested in perfect at all. I'm interested in color. I'm not gonna mark it from here to here. I'm actually gonna put it probably, let's see right about here. Find that center. Now, oh, hold on, that's a little off. Let's fix this. So what I'm doing in terms of finding this point, you could also measure it. That's about, about four and a half. You could just mark it at you know two or two point three quarters, so on and so forth. You know, as long as it's like a sort of general triangle. And I could do the same thing here. I could also make another vertical line or hold, excuse me, horizontal line and just say, okay, I'm going to have it all meet there. At this point, again, I do not have to be perfect. I'm not interested in perfect, I'm interested in color. 
that's more important. I'm interested in terms of how we mix our colors. Just cleaning off some of these edges. Okay. So, so far, just darken this one more time. There you go. I'll darken this one more time. I'll darken this line one more time, just so I can keep a nice bold mark. This one one more time. Okay. So far, so good. Any questions so far? Now, again, what I could do is just sort of follow along these areas. I'm just making a curve that meets at all of these angles. And now that sort of helps me divide. For example, I could do that is another primary, which is red. This will be a direct secondary. This will be another, so on and so forth. Actually, this line here actually will be great. So here to here, do, do this. Or oh, you know what? I'm gonna raise this slightly higher. Here, remember, I'm not interested at all. Secondary, I'm going to lower this. Again, I'm not really interested in these measurements, remember. I just want to get my cir circle down. because I can just tape this off and go back and work from it if you need to. This one. Perfect. Again, not interested again by getting my exact colors. And then that one. Perfect. So I got just an idea of my lines. I can start erasing all those lines that I had before. Don't need them. And it's helpful to use the white eraser because it takes off a lot of the graphite, which is the pencil. Okay, guys, this may be just going to take some time and then have your outline so I can even go back again I could refine some of those lines I could take a ruler and just make it a much more bolder right same thing here and here and then so on and so forth okay Does that makes sense so far At least gives you an idea.
What questions do we have about this so far? And again, sometimes these could be wider or skinnier. I could always adjust it, like make a line that goes through here and then just erase this. Remember, I'm not interested in how wide these are. I'm interested in how well you blend. Shauna, go ahead. How well does the paint cover up all that pencil marking? Let's actually do that now. So I have a container of water and I just use this as like my base. And I just literally take my brush and I just leave it in here. So I can anytime if I do need to like you know, water it down, I leave it in there. But also another thing to keep in mind, once you're painting, you really wanna have your best friend next to you. What I'm talking about is paper towel, okay? So what I like to do is I have my container and I have my sort of, uh, I can have the paper towel in my hand. So if I, if I pick up, you know, a watered down brush when it's clean, I could just damp it with the paper towel so it's ready to go. But then let's say, for example, if I have my, side here if I have my palette paper and let's actually start laying down some color you could remove a sheet out of your palette paper put it on your table it's up to you but what I'm going to do is just for the sake of the demo have just a portion of my palette paper ready now I like to always tape the palette paper on a flat surface because it so it doesn't move okay and that's more than enough so let's go back to what shauna was talking about what happens if i add color on top of the graphite in terms of how transparent or semi-transparent will it be let's have my primary so i have a blue okay I have my yellow Seconds. Sorry, I'm just trying to close these tabs. And then I have my ribbon. And I think, you know, let me double check to see if I have my academy at red. Give me once. Oh. I may have some academy at red. Perfect. This red is a little bit more brighter, let's just say. It almost has like a magenta tint to it, kind of. The cadmium colors are pretty great, but they also could be really, really um, <laughs> troublesome, to say the least. So, take my brush. Okay. Can everybody can see this? Let me know if you can, okay? Now again, take some red, stamp it with some water, just a little bit on the palette paper. Remember not to add too much water. Yeah, this has more of sort of a magenta. Now I can tape all these edges, but I can just follow this line as a guide. And just again, add my first primary. Now, Shauna, this goes back to your question about transparency as well as sort of how, how well does it cover? It's really depending on how much pigment you use. I just, uh, I flipped my, uh, my canvas paper because then now I can start making cleaner edges but look, I added more water. It almost becomes too transparent. I want it more opaque. Opaque meaning you can't see through. Transparent meaning you could see through. I can start to, again, get 
and I'm not interested in measurements. I'm interested in how well you could blend. But once this is dry, okay, I can then go back and work on other parts of the painting. If we add cleaner edges, I'm using that round number 12. I'm just going to let that be here. I'm going to wait for that to dry. Now, for example, let's make a secondary color. Okay. What happens if I mix red and yellow? I get what? Orange. So I have my red here, I have my yellow. Be careful not to cross contaminate your brushes. So, always, like you can see here, this has a lot of yellow take your palette knife you could grab some of it here and put it on the other, another area of their palette and then grab some red and then mix it and this is what i mean let me zoom in so you guys can see what i'm talking about this is what i mean by using your palette knife and you can see it's closer more to the red now then I got to have to then evaluate and say, okay, I'm going to pick some of it up. You can see there's all that chunk of paint. I'm going to lower it down and then apply a little bit of gravity to mix into it. This is what I, and then you can stretch it out and start to see what color comes out off to the color mixture. Now, if that's too red, I'm going to pick it up off my palette and just put it on the side. I'm going to take my paper towel and clean off all of that edge. So I have a nice clean palette to work from. I'm going to add more yellow. Okay, that's a lot of yellow. But again, for the sake of the demo, I'm going to put gradually take some of this red up and see if I mix more of the yellow. Do I get more orange color? You see that? Now it's a bit more 50-50. Flatten it out. Do you guys see that? It's really important once you're mixing your colors not to cross contaminate your brushes and your palettes. Always have your paper towel while it's still wet. Bam, new, ready to go, right? I can even change it even more. I'm gonna pick up more yellow. Gonna move the ruler. Is there like a certain shade or of orange that you're looking for for our color wheel? I would follow the, the actual handout in lecture itself palette in terms of that color wheel, but I want you to eyeball it too and look at this carefully through observation. Trust your eyes. That's a red, that's a yellow. I'm going to find a good orange for your preference. A good would be 50 50, but you know, I added too much red, it was too much as a second, as a tertiary color, which is more what? More red or orange. I need a nice even secondary color, which is pure orange. And to my liking, and depending on how much yellow I add, I can add more, okay? Again, always, again, don't cross contaminate. Take your paper towel, add some yellow here. I'm gonna grab a little bit of this, just a little bit, okay? And this is the sort of, again, experimentation process of seeing how much or how little. It's almost like cake batter. If you, those of you who are bakers or cooks, you can since see like that's a nicer orange and that this is more of a tertiary color, which is more red orange. This is a more secondary color, which is more orange. And then if I dilute that even further, meaning change the color temperature even further, in terms of color mixing. Let's say if I want a more yellow orange, take some more yellow. I'm gonna pick some of this up just a little bit and mix it here. I wanna do it all on my palette because then if I see what I've done, I can then go back and say, oh, Shauna, what color did you mix to make this color? Did you add more yellow? Did you add more red? Then you can then go back to your palette and say, oh, I, add, I think I added more of the red more of the yellow to make it more yellow orange instead of orange or instead of more red or orange. So these are all colors 
I can then now apply to the color wheel. Did that make sense? This is for everybody. Yes. Okay. This is a part of the trickier part of this uh, whole process of the color wheel is 90% of the job is the mixing, 90%. The other 10% is just sort of, again, drawing this out, which is, you know, took only a few minutes. Again, I'm not interested in measurements. I'm not, remember that. I'm interested to see how well you've mixed a secondary color, okay? So for example, I take my brush, I'm gonna clean it, okay? I have my container. I always like to use like a, just a dirty ceramic container, something old that's not too fragile, okay? Take some water, clean it up. You may need to get some more paper towels, okay? Take this sort of color here, this sort of really nice yellow orange, excuse me, this uh, orange, apply it here, and I wanna see what that looks like. I wanna see it in relationship right next to the primary, right next to it, okay? Notice I'm just making a light wash, just so I can, I don't have to make it too dirty. Craftsmanship is a part of this process, but honestly, to be, to be frank with everybody, I'm more interested to know if you can mix the colors rather than painting it directly on the canvas paper. Okay. And I, then I look and go back and start to see, can I add more, can I add less? You may need to change it. You may need to, you know, change the intensity. You may have to even paint over it again. Don't ever throw this away. Don't ever throw away your work. Put it on the side, come back to it later. If you're ever frustrated, there's a reason why you're frustrated, okay? If you're ever impatient, there's a reason why you're impatient about it because you're rushing this process. Do not rush painting. It's very slow, okay? It needs time to breathe. It needs time to dry. It needs time to actually do what you, what, what you want it to do, okay? So that's a secondary color. Now, if I added a tertiary color, it would be more yellow, red, right? Or more what? More redder orange, okay? These are things I want you to experiment. And again, when you're done with your palette, okay, try not to use too much paint because you don't want to waste too much. I've seen a lot of students also waste too much paint. They apply way too much on their palettes and then they just throw it away. They're like, oh, I ran out of blue. Well, we got to go buy more blue, right? Something to consider. Any questions so far about the color wheel? Um, I have to get to a softball practice. Is it okay if I leave? Yeah. Again, guys, you can leave whenever you want. I can't, you know, make anybody stay. Thank you. Have a great day. My pleasure. As, as long as you have your questions answered, you are free to go. You do whatever it is you like. These will be uploaded by the end of today, too. So keep that in mind. Any other questions so far about the color wheel? Okay, now let's hop over to the painting, to the large scale.